Over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the Christian home. And uh, the Christian home is supposed to look different than the non-Christian one. My fear is that it often doesn't. So, in other words, the Christian home is nominal. That is, it's Christian in name only. My suspicion is that so many so-called Christian marriages aren't really Christian and Christian homes aren't really Christian. That is, they're not really any different than those of lost houses or those of lost people's marriages. Their lives aren't really different than unbelievers. I think that's barely, I suspect, that's fairly prevalent in the church today. In Peter's day, it was different. In Peter's day, the church was different. In Peter's day, the church wasn't like the world around them. They think differently than the world thinks. They act differently than the world thinks. They value different things than the world values. And because of that, they're being persecuted. That's one of the main themes of 1 Peter is the suffering of the believer because of his faith. Peter's readers are struggling as foreigners, as strangers, as aliens in the world, and they're facing persecution and other, other difficulties. And throughout this letter, Peter's been encouraging them to press on in the midst of hardship. He encourages them to submit to the word of God. He encourages them to suffer for his name. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at how that happens, perhaps even in the house. Peter's been writing about the Christian wife. And what we saw in the last two weeks, or the last two Sunday nights at least, is that the Christian wife submits to her husband and to her God. She has reclaimed her role, her part, as a suitable helper, a help meet. Right? And she finds satisfaction in carrying out that role. The modern woman doesn't find satisfaction in that. The modern American woman finds satisfaction only in her appearance or primarily in her appearance, and if not in her appearance, in her sometimes uh, independence of anyone else. I don't need no man, right? <laughs> or whatever is the, you know, out there these days. The godly woman, though, finds satisfaction in the Lord. And therefore, she, has, she, she develops godliness and godly character. But it's not just the Christian wife that makes up the Christian home, it's the Christian husband. And that's an area that's been really lacking in a lot of houses. The Christian husband is supposed to stand out as different from the world. But I think, again, my suspicion again is that so many so-called Christian husbands or Christian fathers or Christian men really are no different and act no different and think no different than unsaved men, think no differently than unsaved men. They're so focused on their careers or on making money or on whatever, their education and uh, leisure, entertainment. Their spiritual walks are secondary. If you talk to young Christian men, one of the things that I've found uh, when I talk to kids that grow up in the church, teenage years, thinking about college, stuff like that. And I like to ask them what they're thinking about for college or for their future. And what I never hear is, I'm not sure, but I want to do something that pleases God. Or I am sure, and I want to do something that pleases God. What, 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 you know, I want to go to this such and such university. I want to get such and such a grade so that such and such secular university will accept me in so that I can study in this field. And I know that field makes a few dollars. Often, what those young people don't realize is that very few people actually work in the field that they studied in, all right? Teachers will work in the field they studied in and stuff like that, but Outside of that, really, you know, percentages are low. People study some field and they never work in that field. And they spend all that money and all that time and energy to focus on their careers and jobs that would make them money because that's how they measure success. Instead of in the pages of this book. And that's how a lot of men think. And that's how a lot of Christian men think. And their marriages pay the price and their families pay the price because at the, as goes husband 
often goes the family. The Christian husband plays an important role in a godly marriage. And we see that in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. First, the Christian husband lives with his wife in an understanding way. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman. Now, I want to focus just on this for now. All right, we're going to spend the first half of the message just kind of focusing on this statement, and then we'll finish off with the rest of it. Before we really unpack that at all, the Apostle Paul uh, wrote something about the Christian husband as well, and we could see that over in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So what we have here is the husband's love for the wives, sacrificial love for the wives, is grounded in or is a reflection of Christ's love for the church, Christ's sacrificial love for the church. And what we see in Christ's love for the church in verses 20, what we see in verse 26, 7 is not necessarily a husband's love for the wife. It's Christ's love for the church so that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the word and present to himself the church in all her glory, glory having no spot or wrinkle. So there's this, this, this move towards the, the, the edification of the church, which is reflected in the husband's leadership role, spiritual leadership role in the family. Often, the man misunderstands what leadership is. You know, we, we think of the servant leadership that Christ spoke of. We think of things like, he who wishes to be first will be last, servant leadership, you know, that type of stuff. But we think of leadership, the, at least secular, worldly people think of leadership, um, the way Vladimir Putin thinks of leadership, which is a dominating force, right? And that's a little bit different than what the Apostle Paul had in mind here, obviously. Paul's writing about the husband's sacrificial love, and his love for his wife is like that of Christ's for the church, that of sacrifice. He considers what's best for her and vice versa. Too often, marriage partners are entirely too selfish, and, you know, I'm, I'm only going to do my part if she or he does their part. So if they do right, that's when I'll do right. And then they get mad when they don't get what they want. They expect the partners to change for them, but they don't consider how they themselves might glorify God in the situation they're in. And I say, and I, I say this all the time, is your, your walk with God is never dependent on anyone else, on anyone else's behavior, even your spouse's. Over in Colossians 3, Paul also writes, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Here Paul also writes about the husband's love for his wife, and he wrote about the husband not being bitter against his wife. Peter also considered Christian marriage here in verse 7, and he calls out the Christian husband in this passage, and he tells them to live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, this statement has the force of a command. It has the force of an imperative in this passage. It, it's something the husbands must do. This is a command about how husbands are to handle their wives. Literally, it means live according to knowledge. That means the husband has to try to understand his wife. Now, I'm going to tell you, guys, I know that seems like a lost cause. Anyone here think they understand women? If you do, you're probably lying or you're just proud, right? Um, sometimes, and not always, anytime I say men are this or women are that, that's always in general. That's always exceptions to those types of rules, right? So if I say something like, sometimes women in general are less direct than men, that's not always the case. There are some women that are very direct, right? But from a man's perspective, it's like, sometimes women aren't so direct. Let me give you a few examples. And these are popular, well-known types of illustrations. This is what she says. Honey, the garbage is getting full. 
What does she mean? Let's interpret, let's, let's translate female. All right, this is for the men. This is not for the women. Let's translate female here. So we, sometimes we translate other languages like Greek or Hebrew or something. We're going to translate female. Honey, the garbage is getting full. I think, oh, okay, it's full. That's an interesting fact. What does she mean? I want you to take out the trash now, right? Am I right? Do I have that one? All right, let's, number two. Honey, <laughs> I have nothing to wear. Men, what does that actually mean? What's that? It's a lie. What it means is I have a million things to wear. I just don't like the way any of them look on me at this moment. Am I right? Did I get that one? Am, am I translating that properly? Three, Sunday morning before church. Honey, how do I look in this dress? What does she mean? You're dead. That's what she means. She means I want a compliment. That's what I want. I want a reassurance. Am I right about that? Am I generally? I don't want honesty. I don't want to know what you really think about how I look in this dress. I want assurance. Do I have this? Am I right? I'm figuring this out a little bit. What she says, honey, it's okay. What does she mean? <laughs> it's definitely not okay. Right? <laughs> Something like that. Am I generally, do I have this? One more. When she says, I'm fine. What does she mean? I want to murder you, right? <laughs> Something along those lines. So, so translif men, we have to live in an understanding way. And I'm not saying that's an easy, easy thing to do. And ladies, help us out. Help us out a little bit, okay? Because we, we, you can drop down, you could drop out hints like, hey, you know, I noticed that, you know, the, the door didn't get fixed. It's still squeaking. And we're over here like, Oh, yeah, it is squeaking. Anyway, I'm going to go eat something. You know what I mean? Food. Me want food. You know what I mean? Me want drink. Like, we don't understand, like, what you're asking us. Like, you have to tell us because, you know, we're not thinking that way. If women are a little less direct with us, you know, we, 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 we don't always get it, right? Um, but the language that's here is that you're living in a way, you're living according to knowledge. You're, 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 the, the, the idea of understanding, live in an understanding way, means to live in a, with consideration. So, yeah, I do have to understand a little bit about my wife, which is a confusing thing, right, for a 44-year-old adult male still. Maybe when I'm 60, I'll feel differently, but it's still a little confusing. Um, but the idea here is consideration, being thoughtful, uh, being respectful, knowing how to appropriately handle the relationship, understanding God's will in a marriage, understanding what she needs and how to help her grow closer to the Lord. The Christian husband recognizes that his wife is a sister in Christ. He wants her to grow closer to the Lord. He wants to grow closer to the Lord, and he un understands and embraces his role in the house. And I know the modern world says that, you know, there, there are no roles, basically. The man is being replaced with the woman and vice versa. But in the Bible, the man is supposed to be a spiritual leader, not a domineering dictator. Not Fidel Castro, right? So some men don't understand their wives and they don't even try. Others will dominate their wives instead of leading them. You have the language here. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman. Now, what does it mean? What does this phrase mean, someone, with, that she is the weaker vessel? Here's a few ideas that are out there. A few people think that Peter is writing about her social standing and her legal rights in the ancient world, that she doesn't have the same social standing, she doesn't have the same legal rights in first, the first century culture. And that may be true. There may be something there. 
Others think that her weakness is because she's subject to her husband's authority. And that there may be, I'm telling you these things because I'm not 100% sure, okay? But there may be something there. Some think that, uh, that she's more emotionally sensitive. I'm not sure about that one, maybe, I don't know. I think this is actually about um, driving ability. That's, that's, that's what I think, you know. Um, I, I let my wife drive anytime I don't mind putting my life at risk. So I'm pretty sure that's what this, kids, uh, am I right, kids? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, speak of drive, speaking of driving, I drive my wife everywhere, but she always finds her way back home. Sorry. Um, sleeping on the couch tonight. <laughs> so it's certainly not, I'm joking. Uh, it's certainly not a mental weakness. All right, that, that, that is, or an intellectual weakness, that's foolishness. Okay, we don't see that in scripture anywhere. Men are equal in intelligence, but different in role, in function. And again, there is a movement today that wants to deny any difference between the sexes. They want to, they want to blur the lines. I would often say obliterate the line between the genders. They want masculine women and feminine men. There was, uh, there was a magazine that came into our house and there was a guy on this magazine and he was wearing eyeliner and he was wearing nail polish and he was a popular singer or something. I don't know if he was, I think he was a singer or he was an actor or something like that. Someone important like an actor. You know, I don't know what he was. Um, but men and women are different, equal but different, regardless of what society wants to tell you. And so all the more, there's, there's some disadvantage that Peter has in mind, whether it be cultural standing, whether it be physical, maybe physical weakness. Think about the fact that in many cases, women aren't physically as strong as men. Like, I, one of the reasons why men aren't allowed to compete in female sports. Oh, sorry, I guess they are now, aren't they? Men can compete in women's sports now. But up until, up until recent Democrat policies were put in place, men were never allowed to compete in women's sports because there was a physical advantage there. Not always, there are some women, I, I, mm -mm. I don't wanna fight with that woman. <laughs> I don't wanna wrestle with that woman. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, so it's, again, when we speak of generality, it's not always true, but in general, men have more physical strength than women do. So, so, so that could be it. We're just not 100% sure. Peter's telling the husband to live in an understanding way, especially since there is some limitation that the wife is facing with regard to her husband. And it could be anything from social standing to physical differences, you know, as far as strength goes, to the fact that she has to submit and he has to lead. I don't know for sure which is the case. But what I do know is that he is telling, Peter's telling the husband to live in an understanding way, a considerate way, recognizing those limitations and helping them want to grow closer to the Lord. Because if you're a spiritual leader, that's what you're doing, right? You're leading someone spiritually. The Christian husband recognizes that his wife is a suitable helper and he lives with her in an understanding way. He recognizes that it's not always easy to be submissive, which she is called to do oftentimes, and she has to do that to fulfill her role. And he has to help her want to do that. And so he needs to respect her, even though um, he's at some form of, at least in the first century, and I would say still today, at some form of an advantage within society or physically or whatever that is. The Christian husband lives with his wife in an understanding way. He also honors his wife. Uh, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. So the word here, uh, show her honor, means respect her. Why? Because she is a fellow heir of the grace of life. She is a believer, if she's a believer. She's a child of God. She's a sister in Christ. Jesus Christ is her advocate. He pleads on her behalf. And if God be for her, who can be against her? 
So the Christian husband treats her as a sister in the Lord. He respects her as a believer. He's not the dominating Fidel Castro, dictatorial, Vladimir Putin type of a dude, right? I must control, me must control everything. Meat, me want meat, you know, obey me. You know, it's not that, that's not it. I set the rules, you follow them. It's not it, it's not it. One day the Christian husband will stand before God and answer for how he treats his wife. You might remember in the context that Peter's readers are suffering unjustly because of their faith. And you can bet that Peter doesn't want the Christian wife to suffer unjustly because of a Christian husband. Notice a reason why, we have two reasons why he shows her honor. So I see, I see really like two parts of this verse. There is the live with your wife in an understanding way. There is the show her honor. And one of the reasons why you're showing her honor is that she is a fellow heir of the grace of life. She's a believer. She is um, a sister in the Lord. And another reason is so that your prayers will not be hindered. Your prayer life is directly dependent. Your, your, the fact that whether your prayers are answered is directly dependent on your relationship with your spouse. What we see here is a clear purpose statement. So their command is, or the function of a command, it's kind of like a command here, show her honor. And the purpose is, or at least the result is, so that your prayers will not be hindered. So your prayers can be hindered. Your prayers can go unanswered because of your relationship, because of your marriage. If a Christian husband doesn't show respect to his wife, his prayers will be hindered. God will not hear the prayers of a bad husband, will not answer the prayers of a bad husband. Uh, in First Peter, what we've seen up to this point is that God protects those who are mistreated, that they are precious in his sight. And if you're the one who is mistreating a, a child of God, then you are an oppressor just like the Gentiles were an oppressor to the church. Husbands are not to be oppressors to their wives. They are, and a key word that shows up here is fellow heirs. Even the word kind of displays something of inequality, right? We're fellow heirs. It reminds me of, uh, of, uh, of something that Peter writes in chapter five, when he's writing to the, uh, the pastors, who he himself is a fellow pastor, right? He's, he's uh, here, let me look at the, let me think of the language here. All right. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. So what we have here in just a couple of chapters is Peter writing to the pastors of the churches, and he himself is a fellow elder. Now he's He's exhorting them, he's encouraging them, he's teaching them something, he's calling them to his side to give them truth, but he's on equal plane with them. He's a fellow, they're co-workers for the gospel. And we see that similar language back here in chapter three and verse seven, where the husband and the wife are fellow heirs of the grace of life. We, and again, the assumption here is a saved husband and a saved wife, that we are fellow heirs. There is a partnership. It makes you think of Jesus' words, what God has put together, let not man put asunder, right? Let not man separate, right? Marriage is for life. We see that in the gospel of Matthew. And so there's a certain way to treat your wife. 
And it's not uh, by being embittered against them, even if she almost kills you when she's driving. <laughs> I'm just teasing, but no, not really. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not being uh, lacking in understanding. It's not lacking respect or honor for her, right? It's a fellow heir. And that is, to me, a key word here when it comes to the mindset of the husband when it comes to his wife. She is a fellow heir. She's not someone who is beneath you. She's not less than you. She's not less, into, I mean, sometimes maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe she's less intelligent, maybe she's more intelligent, right? But just by nature of her being your wife doesn't make her less intelligent than you. Doesn't make you better and therefore full of pride and arrogance oftentimes. Fellow heirs of the grace of life. And so you need to live with your wife in an understanding way, get to know her better. Ask her some questions, pay attention to her, consider her wants and her needs, make it easy, make it easy. Remember how I talked about, I said, ladies, make it desirable for your husband to come home to you, right? Make him like look for like, you know, can't wait to get home. Sometimes a guy's like, uh, whatever I got to do to stop from getting, going home. Let me go to the bar. It's a better option than going home. Remember I said, ladies, make it desirable for here. Make it easier for her to follow you. Make it easier for her to submit to you. Help her want to grow closer to the Lord. Live with her in an understanding way. Show honor to her. Show respect for her. Give her a high place in your home. Your wife should be your first human priority. Now, what often happens is that's not the case. Often, the number one priority for men is what? I, th I think I heard a few times, their careers, work. Work is more important. Now look, guys, I understand, like, if we're not working, something just does, it's not right. Like, like you don't feel right if you're not working. Like, you feel like you need to be working. Or when, and, and when you're not working and when you have time on your hands, then you can really start feeling like, what's the point of life? You know, I... I'm doing nothing, I'm wasting my life away. And so there is, there is a, well, almost an innate drive within us to work to a certain extent. So I'm not saying work isn't important, but work is not more important than your wife. It's not. What's something else that's often more important for men than their marriages? Uh, I can't hear. I heard some. What's that? Sports. I'm going home to watch some sports tonight. So can we skip that one? <laughs> she says sports. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah. I'm still skipping it. <laughs> but yeah, your wife is more important than sports. Absolutely. Let's give another one. That's the one I was thinking. Sometimes in a marriage relationship, the children are more important than the spouse. Now, this is true for men and, and for women. Uh, am I generally right about that? This is not just a man thing. Uh, I, actually, I, I actually suspect that women are more guilty of this one than, than men. Mothers, in particular, are more guilty of this than, than men are. But it does work for men, too. So, you know, oh, little, little Johnny... Let's follow little Johnny and little Susie and focus all of our lives around little Johnny and little Susie. And then when little Johnny and little Susie grow up and they graduate and they move out, now it's just you two. And what do they call that? They call that empty nest syndrome or something. And it's like, I don't even know who you are. 
Well, yeah, you don't know who she is. You haven't talked to her for 25 years. How would you know who she is? You've spent too much time focusing on your kids and not enough time developing your relationship with your spouse. Anything else? In some cases, I think that's less of a thing today, hanging out with the friends, because I think as a, as a culture, we've become more and more isolationist. I think we've become more and more like individual. So, but it still can be a thing. You, you giving your friends priority. Anyone else have anything? I've, I, I'm, I'm pretty well. What's that? Stuff, money. I think that would be connected to, to work, right? Because most people work because they want more money so that they could get more stuff. My car, my car, Betsy, is more important than my wife, Betsy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whatever, I don't know. Uh, yeah, sometimes things become more, but let's face the facts when, when, and I've said this before, when you're on your deathbed, you're not gonna look back and think, I wish I would have spent more time cleaning my car or sitting in front of my, uh, my cell phone, or my iPad, or my internet machine, or, or I wish I would have spent time, more time working. You're gonna be thinking about the people, right? In your life that you love, that you neglected because you were too busy on this machine, letting this, it's a glorious machine, it really is, if it's used properly, but um, sitting on this glorious and inglorious machine, wasting your life away while well, important relationships in your life got neglected. We're all guilty to a certain extent. Abby, what were you gonna say? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's some, some good ideas. What we have in this passage, and I told you, the pastor giveth and the pastor taketh away. So I told you we were gonna be shorter tonight and I'm throwing you a bone. Right? Every once in a while, I got to throw a bone. So I think we're going to wrap it up there. But in the passage, what we have is that the Christian husband lives with his wife in an understanding way. He honors her before the Lord, giving her a high place of priority in his life. If you have any questions or comments about that, or you want any counsel or advice, come and see me. And I'd be happy to share that, share some more stuff with you. Uh, in the meantime, let's take our hymnals and turn to 391. And we'll close our service with a hymn, 391.